Guiding principles of the Constitution. All of these principles are going to be guided by this big idea, and that is limited government. Too much power, the kind we had under the King of Britain, leads to corruption. A government with too much power becomes corrupt and hurts the people. Conversely, the Articles of Confederation had too little power, which led to instability. It led to chaos. You need to limit the power of government, but give it enough to get its job done as so eloquently put by James Madison in Federalist Number 51. The first principle is popular sovereignty, this idea that the people are the source of the power. We see this in the preamble, we the people. It's the first three words of the Constitution. We the people create this government. In other words, we're giving government its power. We see it in Article 1 of the Constitution, in that the House of Representatives is chosen by the people. We see it in Article 4 of the Constitution, which says that every state will have a Republican, little r, meaning representative, form of government. Principle number two is the rule of law, that we're going to follow a system of laws that are written down and widely known, not the arbitrary decisions made by a king or any individual. Power is limited by what's on paper. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. In other words, you cannot discriminate against people from other states. This was a problem under the Articles of Confederation. The rule of law is going to solve this by writing in the Constitution that we're all equal in different states. We see this most importantly in what's called the Supremacy Clause, Article 6 of the Constitution which clearly spells out that the Constitution and the laws that come from the federal government shall be the supreme law of the land. Principle number three is the idea of separation of powers. We take the legislative powers and give those to Congress. The job of carrying out the laws to the executive branch and the job of ruling on the laws to the judicial branch. When we divide power between different branches of government, that's separation of powers. And then we allow each branch of government a little bit of oversight, a little bit of say in the other branches process. For example, Congress has oversight over the executive branch with various committees. Congress has oversight over the judicial branch by getting to approve judges. That's checks and balances. Power in the hands of one would be tyranny. So we separate the powers and allow the different branches to check on each other. This prevents one branch from dominating, dominating, and the checks further limit the powers of those branches. We can see this throughout the Constitution in various shapes and forms. Principle number four is the idea of federalism. Federalism is dividing powers, not between different branches, but between different levels, like state and national governments. Now, remember, under the Articles, the states had the power. So all of this is from the perspective of the states, which is why the powers that are in the Constitution that the federal government gets are called delegated powers, because the states delegated or gave those to the federal government. Those that are specifically spelled out and listed are called enumerated powers, powers like regulating immigration, the power to make treaties, the power to declare war. Those are specifically listed as powers that the federal government has. But Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 says that the federal government also has the power to do all things that are necessary and proper to carry out those specific listed powers like regulating immigration, making treaties, and declaring war. This is why Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 is called the Elastic Clause, because it stretches the power of the federal government. The first example we have of this is the Federal Bank of the United States, which is created not because the Constitution says Congress can make a bank, but because the Constitution says that Congress has the power to regulate commerce. And when you combine the power to regulate commerce with the elastic clause, you can read between the lines and justify Congress having the power to create a bank. Those powers that were not given to the federal government are called reserved powers because the states kept those to themselves. For example, marriage laws, divorce laws, driver's license. A lot of the day-to-day -day stuff that we think about is carried out by the states. 
These are further reserved by the Tenth Amendment, which says that the powers not delegated to the federal government remain at the state level. There are also what we call concurrent powers. These are powered, powers that are shared by state and national government. For example, both states and the federal government can tax the people. Both states and the federal government can enforce laws. So Article 5 clarifies this part of federalism, this idea of concurrent powers. Principle number five is an independent judiciary. Hamilton laid it out in Federalist number 78. This is the idea that you need to have a judicial branch that is removed from the whims of the public, from the current topics in discussion in politics at this time. This is why judges hold their office during good behavior, in other words, for life. And this is why judges receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. In other words, a judge can't have their salary changed after they get their job. In other words, Congress can't punish a judge for making decisions that Congress doesn't agree with. Congress can't fire a judge. A judge can step down and a judge can be impeached, but a judge serves for life. The judiciary branch is independent of the normal whims of politics. Finally, principle number six, individual rights. Remember that debate between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists? Federalists, like the Constitution, many Anti-Federalists felt it would create a government that was too strong, a government that would take away their rights, which is why the First Amendment was added, which is why the whole Bill of Rights was added. The First Amendment, seen here, lays out very specifically rights that the Founding Fathers found very important, some of which were taken away by the British. These rights are guaranteed in the First Amendment. Heck, even in the main part of the Constitution, Article 3 lays out that you are guaranteed a trial by jury unless you're a public official being impeached. Remember what had happened to smugglers. Under British rule, they were sent to those vice admiralty courts in Canada or in England. Those are not a jury of their peers. So this is something that the Founding Fathers were wary of. Individual rights, along with all of those other principles, are in the Constitution. They're, they make up the fundamental core of American government.